Good day to Mark Lewison. Good day and nice to be here again. So for this interview, we're going to have a bit of a focus as you have been focusing all year on 1969. You've been dealing with Hornsey Road. Uh, we've got some mixed topics and a few listener questions that they've submitted and they're the Ask Mark segment, if you like. <laughs> I'm sure you're familiar with I it. I am, yes. Um, 2019, it's a huge year in the life of Mark Lewison. The second half is um, you've been immersed in Abbey Road, obviously. Um, I'd like to come back to that in more detail soon. But what are 12 months? November 1968 to December 1969. 50 years later, mm -hmm. you've been dealing with a lot of those moments. Yes. The White Album yes. was released. Uh, Let It Be album was recorded. And Abbey Road was recorded and released. Three vastly different albums. There was a couple of non-album singles in that lot. We're mm -hmm. talking about really 12 months. John and Yoko in Amsterdam. That's just one year in your volume three. Yes. And I, and I guess the Beatles' lives are full of those types of years. Every year is eventful in the Beatles' world, or was eventful, and um, the events change, but the, 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 the chaotic nature of them, the amount, the amount of things they, they packed into each 12 months, um, and each 12 months did seem to be quite distinct in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. You can really look at each year. There's very little blurring of the lines. Uh, yes, yes, so this has been a particularly, it was an eventful 12 months for them and has been for me in covering it. You started off reliving January 1969. You listened to all of the material from 50 years ago on the same day. Yes, well I did what many had done before me. I'm certainly not the only one to have done it. Um, so I sometimes feel a bit of a fraud speaking about it as if I did something unique. I haven't. All I did was devote myself to listen to the January 1969 audio recordings, those that circulate, which is about 98 hours of mm -hmm. tape. Uh, I, I listened to each day on its 50th anniversary. So I began January 2, 69 on January 2, 2019. By the time they were on the roof on the 30th, I was listening on the 30th of January this year. And when they finished on the 31st, I was listening on the 31st. Mm -hmm. And it was a marathon. Um, but I... I know others who had already done it, yeah. and uh, it was somewhat to my shame that I never had. I mean, 97, 98 hours of tape of the Beatles that pretty much I hadn't heard. I'd heard in extract form on bootlegs, but I'd never heard the whole thing, and the, the discs have been sitting on my shelves for years. So it was really quite late that I got to it, but I'd, I had it in mind to do it on the anniversary, and that made it special. What a strategy. Yes. You waited the 50th year. Yes. The only thing is that uh, in 1969, the calendar was different from 2019. So a Monday in 1969 was not a Monday this yeah. year. Yeah. Um, but I also listened, I listened in real time, but I kept stopping it to make notes and to, I had a, an old transcript that had been done many, many years ago. And th this was my opportunity to review that transcript and improve it as I was going through. So six hours of their day in 1969 could take me 12 yeah. to get through in, yeah. in 2019. Yeah. And by the time I think they got to the 21st or 22nd of January, they did every day straight. So I had to do every day straight. No matter what day of the week it was here, I would have to do it. So my, I just devoted the month to it, essentially. And did you, well, you have survived. Was it <laughs> difficult? No, no. In fact, it was incredibly uplifting. Mm. Um, the big takeaway, and people may have heard me say this on other podcasts, is that it, it completely trans, transformed my view of what that month had been. I was guilty in my books of having written the, the standard line about that month, that it was a miserable month mm. for them. And as George Martin said, they were arguing all the time. <laughs> and, uh, you know, one has to take those views on board. Initially, we didn't have any tapes to compare it with. Mm. But now that I've heard the month, it was, it was not at all as I had been led to believe. Um, there were elements of it, of course, and there's no doubting that George did walk out, but he also did return. And um, I, I found it actually quite an uplifting month for them, believe it or not. I mean, George, George and John, their views must have been coloured by the Let It Be film when they look back on that month in later years and called it the low of all time yeah. and the most miserable sessions ever. John didn't, did not sound miserable in the moment of their recording. So it was, it was much more uplifting than I expected it to be. I, I would recommend anyone to listen to it. It's, it's quite a, I mean, you don't have to do what I did, mm. but I, if you do get into it, it, there is a lot there. And of course they speak 
in passing references and sometimes direct references to earlier years, yeah. people that they met on tour. Remember when we saw so-and-so on tour and said, oh, I didn't know they met them. Oh, yeah. And you say, well, where did they meet them? And so you stop and do the research. Oh, that must be where they met. And so there are, it was important for me for volume two to hear them in 1969. And also um, the other thing is that you just get the insight into the way they speak to one another. Yes, exactly. the, the shorthand way that they have of communicating didn't just begin in 1969. We're hearing it in 69, but it obviously goes back to an earlier mm. time as well. Mm. So that was very informative for me to, as the writer of volume two to know how they spoke to one another even in later years. And one of those anecdotes that Paul talks about is that short count again, Jimmy Nickel, I think, in Denmark or something. Yes. You know, he was eyeing off the bird, so he went, two, and catching him out, sort of. So That's yeah. right. So that was an example. Yeah. How fair or unfair that is on Jimmy, we may, <laughs> we may never know, although we do have recordings. I mean, yeah. he, I think he was talking about the first show, so what yeah. would that be, Netherlands? Uh, Copenhagen, Denmark. KB yeah. Harlem, yes, yeah. that's right. But yes. even though it may not be right, it's what they remembered yeah. of it, which is interesting anyway. Yeah. And I, I would be mentioning that even if it isn't correct, um, because it's what we would today call their takeaway from that, from the Jimmy Nickel experience yeah. was not that. Sure it happened. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Big chunk of your life this year, the second half, I would say, but it's probably been much more than that, is Hornsey Road. Mm. You've produced and presented 22 dates, I think, across the UK. Two hours about the wonderful Abbey Road album, which yeah. for me is the, the landmark album. Okay. They're all great, but that's mine. Right. Yeah, that's and, your uh, personal favourite. Yeah, it is my mm -hmm. personal favourite. So, a few questions about that. Typically, um, I think a lot of people in Australia and listeners would like to know, how did you come up with the idea for Hornsey Road? Yeah. Um, late 2018 was the 50th anniversary of the White Album. There was a symposium at Monmouth University in New, jo New Jersey, yep. in the in, uh, USA, east coast of USA. And I was invited to be the keynote speaker uh, and present something. And the organiser, Ken Womack, uh, who r did the two volume biography of George Martin and now a book on Abbey Road as well, mm. um, said to me, oh, just so long as you're there, it doesn't matter what you do, people will just be pleased to see you and you can pretty much do anything. But. <laughs> That isn't the way I work. And I just decided I wanted to give them something special. And I had already done a couple of PowerPoint presentations. I did one on Pepper, and I did one on the Beatles in 64 when they got to America, mm -hmm. a short one. So I thought, well, I'll do a PowerPoint presentation about the Beatles' lives in that time. And I called it Double Lives, because it was the double album. But at the time they're making it, they're doing so much else. They're like, they're recording, and then they're doing everything else, so they're like leading double lives. Mm -hmm. So I called it Double Lives, and it, me being me, I ended up, it, it was very long. Um, it was about three hours. It was an endurance feat for everyone in the audience. Yep. Um, but it had packed a lot of content, mm -hmm. and it took weeks and weeks and weeks to assemble. And during the, I mean, nobody asked me to do that, so it was all my fault. <laughs> but this is just who I am and what I do. And during the course of those three weeks, weeks and weeks and weeks, I'm thinking, what a waste of time. I'm gonna do this once. Yeah. I should, if I did it 10 times, it would make this amount of investment worthwhile. But for, to just do it once seems a bit mad. So I came back to England. I had a dinner booked with the comedian Harry Hill well, Harry Hill's been pretty big in Britain for about 30 years now, and he got in touch with me out of the blue just to say what a great book Tune In is. He had read the extended edition of it, and he wanted to take me for dinner just to congratulate me on a fine piece of work and, and talk Beatles. And uh, so I agreed to go to dinner with him, and he said he'd take a couple of, have a couple of friends there with him. And it turned out that one of them uh, is Ed Smith, who works for the promoter Phil McIntyre. Oh. The uh, comedy and music promoter Phil McIntyre, big in this country for, I don't know how long, 30 years or more. And, um, and Ed said, what, do you, what have you been doing? And I told him about, I just returned from Monmouth. Mm. And I told him about that lecture. And I said, but the problem is I did all that work and only did it once. And he said, well, you could tour it. Oh. Really? He said, yeah, yeah, we could, we could, you could do that in British theatres. I'm sure we could book that. Oh, OK. Uh, but the, the problem is that, uh, in fact, he then came over to my house and I did the whole thing for him just to see it, mm. which he enjoyed. But the problem was, or is, that venues book months in advance. 
So already by just before Christmas last year, they're booking yeah. spring, summer 2019. And by then, White Album is last year's theme. Yeah. Yeah. It's gone. So he said, well, why don't you anticipate a coming anniversary and we'll plan it ahead and we'll book you into the venues for that anniversary period. And so Abbey Road was obvious. Yeah. And that was when it began. It began around January of this year in 2019. And it took, it's taken a long time to put together. I, I spent mm, mm, two or three months waking up in a sweat every morning, not even knowing how I was gonna, how I was gonna structure it. I knew I could get up and do it, although that isn't my particular comfort zone, but I knew I could. Yep. But what would the show be? How would I actually structure it? Would it be chronological? Would it be sequential? And um, in the end, I, I, well, I finally found the formula, but that was around, it must have been around May or June by then, and the show begins, or well, began in September. Mm. So it, it became mm, a lot of pressure, yeah. self-inflicted pressure. That's huge. Yeah. Because yeah. your name's on the ticket and you have to provide. You, you can't just turn up and say, well, you know, here's some half-baked ideas. <laughs> it's a show. Yep. You've got to do it as a show. And everyone said, who knew I was going through a bit of an ordeal, oh, you'll get there. And of course I did get there, but not without a lot of sweat. And mm. I did lose mm. a fair bit of weight this year, yeah. sweating about it. And, but it got there. I got there in the end. It, 25 dates in the end it was. Oh. And... Um, Two hours is, 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 is only, a, <laughs> it's not all of it. Two hours, the first half is an hour and 25. There's typically a 20 minute interval and then about another hour and 10. Yeah, right. So it's a three hour evening for people and I'm on stage for two hours, 45 minutes or thereabouts. Two hours, 35 minutes. And you get to repeat it, which is brilliant. Yes, and I didn't know how much money it was gonna make me and the risk of sounding mercenary, it was all about money because um, I need to fund the writing of the books. Mm -hmm. Life is expensive. And the money, I got a great chunk of money, but that was a very long time ago. And uh, this essentially has been so that I can go quiet again and write yeah. the books. Totally mm. get that. Yeah, it's, totally it, get that. Yeah, th this, this whole tour has been to fund the, the trilogy. Has it met your expectations? How has it gone for you as a person? Has it been successful, I guess? Is the way yeah, it has been successful. Um, most of the shows, many of the shows have sold out. Mm -hmm. We've been playing kind of four to 800 seat theatres. Right. Nobody's ever done this before, so it's a real toe in the water, not just for me, but also for other writers and other historians in taking their subjects out on the road. Um, I, I said, I came up with the line early on that no one has yet disproven, which I saw it must be true, which is a, it's the first time an album has been toured by a speaker. <laughs> yeah. I think you could be right. Yeah, I think I am. And nobody said I'm not. Yeah. So it's, it's a toe in the water in that the audience is out there, the public, when they received their brochures from their local theatres, didn't know what this was going to be. Many of them turned up without knowing exactly what mm. it was going to be. Mm. Um, so next time I do it, if, if there is a next time or next time anybody does it, they can always say, well, it's like that. Yeah, exactly. It's like that show. Yeah, it's it's yeah. an integrated PowerPoint presentation, music and video and ephemera and me linking it without script, yeah. just ad-libbing it. You seamlessly thread a great story. And that's what occurred to me is so much of these were things that were either known well or not known at all. And yeah. we'll come back to some of those. Yeah. But how it's been threaded together seamlessly is just a triumph. Mm. That's and what it I do. It shouldn't be a triumph, but yeah. nobody has done this before. No. And I think congratulate you because I thought it was fantastic. I think it, it's it's been funny for me. Um, I, I have the mindset of a Beatles fan from the sixties and seventies, uh, and I know that in those days, if there was ever the idea of someone going around doing a lecture, an illustrated, integrated content rich lecture about the Beatles I would have been there like yeah. a shot yeah. and yet in 2019 there were quite a few Beatles fans who go well I might go and I, I'm thinking well, how come you're even thinking about it it's never been done before it's it's the subject that we love mm -hmm. you're going to hear stuff you haven't heard and see stuff you haven't seen and even if you have heard and seen it it's going to be integrated in a way that you won't have thought about before. So why do people think maybe they will, maybe they won't? We pegged it at an affordable price mm. because it's the first time that anyone's ever done a tour like this. We wanted to make 
we didn't want the price to put anybody off. Mm. So I could have charged more, but we didn't. Was it around 20 quid? Yeah. 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 Typical ticket price was 20 pounds. Some yeah. venues were more, London was more, mm. but typical 20 pound. And, and that is quite affordable for a night yeah. out. And I would have been to it like a shop if yeah. anybody else had done it. But it, it turns out that not all Beatle fans think the way I do. I mean, if you're interested in the Beatles, why not come and just Im- be, have, have an immersion in yeah. the subject that you love amongst other people who love it too and also you know I, I do it quite intelligently so it's going to be a stimulating evening out not just to kind of oh yeah I knew all that yeah. there is going to be stuff but I'm not moaning I'm just observing that that has happened but we've had a lot of sellout shows and I've played some big venues that are kind of too big for me mm. Um, but even those have had six, seven hundred people in, which yeah. is a success. Great. But, yeah. Shea Stadium, I think somebody once said to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would be that would be interesting, especially as it's been knocked down. <laughs> I'm going to play to rubble. Could you take us through the writing process? Is it is it different to, to writing a book, the slide presentation? Yes, it is in the sense of it. Um, I'm linking content. Basically, the the substance of the show is I go through the album in the order that it was recorded from I Want You through to Because. Uh, And I look at the lives of the people who made it and the events in their lives at that time. And uh, so I I find the content I've got, which may be documents or it may be photographs or it may be any kind of ephemera, um, autographs and so on that they gave at the time. Obviously, the music and the music was mixed for this show. And with the music a lot of imagery to go to show them recording it yeah. so there's a lot the idea of um, that is that people hear the album in an unfamiliar way and they see the pictures of the sessions at the same time as they're hearing it mm-hmm. so they, they feel much closer to the process than they just you know this this is a track from the album yes. they're actually kind of like almost there in the room with them and I burn these um, incense sticks yes. Um, oh, yes. the special Durbar Agabati sticks which was a very difficult they were very difficult to source yep. but i was intent on finding the very incense sticks that the beatles burned or george burned at every beatles recording mm. session so that in the room where i'm presenting in each theater the smell is the smell of the studio because the smell is a very powerful very powerful sense and although it's mostly powerful when you connect it to an event that you've been to nonetheless i wanted people to to smell the room where the beatles worked and without taking them into Abbey Road, take them just by burning the incense. Yeah. And um, so there was a, a lot of thought like that went into it. And then I would write the script. Basically, I just wrote to link the things that people were seeing. And, um, and But then I was intent on not reading it. So I just, I would, each thing is like a post. You need to get to the next post and provide it that you get there, that's fine. And what you say in between is ad lib. I know what I'm gonna be saying, exactly. but, but I don't, I'm not reading it. I wanna be looking people in the eye because I'm, I'm, I'm meant to be kind of an entertainer yes. <laughs> on this. And I believe you had staged costumes. Yes. And um, various other props. Yeah, I had a few ideas. I thought that we should have a zebra crossing set. So there is a zebra crossing with a Belisha beacon, two Belisha beacons flashing on each side. I had a brief that I gave to, took to a prop maker and he made the props yeah. and I, I advance each slide as it were in the presentation in the PowerPoint using a clicker yeah. which is standard stuff in lectures uh, but my clicker is built into a Belisha <laughs> beacon so I'm actually holding a Belisha beacon the whole time and pressing yeah, a button yeah. on that. And for those at home that are following what the hell is a Belisha beacon? A I be- know. Well okay. Yes. The zebra, you know what a zebra crossing is, and most people would. Most countries have a version of a black and white stripe or something that pedestrians can yeah. walk across the road. But in Britain, we have beacons on either side of the crossing, uh, tall poles, black and white, with an orange or yellow, yellowy orange globe on top that flashes mm-hmm. on and off. Mm-hmm. So that cars, when they're, or indeed pedestrians too, but cars particularly, as they're approaching it, can see the crossing from a long way away and make sure they've slowed down or stopped. Yeah. So the cross, that, they're going 24 seven, those, those yeah. beacons. And it's a critical part of that whole St. John's Wood Abbey Road crossing out the front of EMI. Those poles with those lights in that location yeah. are a complete, it's a complete image. Yes. It's part of the experience when yes. you're at Abbey Road, yeah. on Abbey Road. Yes, well, they're on every zebra crossing in the UK. And uh, 
I thought that we should we couldn't have a crossing on the stage without having the <laughs> beacons. Funny. And also, it's just we turn them off during the show because they'd be dis- a distraction. But they're on at the start of the show. They're on during the interval, and they come on again at the end. Marvelous. Yeah, and I wear black and orange and white as well. All those dates across the UK, touring life. I know you've been asked once before, but is it all it's cracked up to be, this touring lark? Yeah, well, it's, and that has been educational for me because I'm writing, I've written about, the first book I ever wrote was about the Beatles tours, yes. but I'd never toured. <laughs> Not until, I mean, I've been on the road in this country all my life, but I've never done that thing of getting to a venue mid-afternoon, doing the setting up, staying in the dressing room, doing the entire show, probably meeting people, I always meet people afterwards, and then you get out of there at half past 11, maybe 12 o'clock at night, then you've got to find your hotel, which you've pre-booked, but you've still got to find it. Uh, And then you get to the hotel and the bar's shut and the restaurant is shut and you've eaten a sandwich somewhere about five hours back. And you, all that has been instructive for me. And I I definitely know now that when I write in volume two of the Beatles tours, uh, I will have a much better sense of it and and be able to share with the reader a much better sense of it. Mm. Uh, I mean, I didn't have screaming girls and I didn't have any groupies, (laughs) um, but I I did have those other experiences of, you know, needing a pee somewhere there's nowhere to pee and Mm. needing a bite Mm. and there's nowhere to eat and needing a drink and there's nowhere to drink. And yeah, and you didn't have Mel and Neil to go and fetch for you? No, I didn't have, I had 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 a tour manager, Mark, uh, another mark yeah. Um, but yeah so it was a great experience and I, I, I'm very glad to have had it I don't know that I'm going to repeat it but we'll see how the finances go yeah. if I need to raise more money at some point I'll do something else yeah. there is a temptation to do something in 2020 and 2021 and people have said you could do this for every album but yeah. I really do have books to write I'm sure the opportunities will present themselves yeah, yeah. You talked about meeting with people after the show, inevitably. Um, so how many people did you meet along the way that might have come forward with another lead or an additional piece of the Beatles puzzle? Yes, quite a lot. Yeah. I hope that would happen, and it has happened. Um, there, there would always be someone who comes up at pretty much every show to say, my uncle worked. It's always now a generation or two back. It's very seldom now the person concerned because... It's, and they're mostly gone mm. but my uncle worked for or my grandfather worked for and he's got this piece of paper um, somebody came up to me in one of the shows with a photocopy of a counterfoil to show that in 1971 John Lennon bought some premium bonds premium bonds for those who aren't British it's kind of like an early form of a national lottery uh, you, you buy a bond it, the government invests that money um, but you have a chance to win a prize every week, or in fact, loads of prizes, cash prizes. And it was interesting to see in 1971 that John bought some premium bonds. Mm. Well, it's a tiny little fragment. I'm not even sure I can use it because my third book will end before then. Mm. Mm. But it's things like that that people come up and say, I've got this, does that interest you? And yes, it does interest me. And uh, somebody, in fact, said that they may be able to have a lead on a photograph of John Alexander Mustard. Very which good. I've been looking for, and I understand that you've very kindly been looking for, and so has your wife. My wife, Leslie, has been diligently looking. We've no success at this point yes. in time, but that we're not, we are we don't give up easily. No. It may be very difficult. But I did a show in Edinburgh uh, last week at the point of recording this, yes. and, uh, and somebody came up to me then and said they might have a lead for finding a photograph of mustard. So, yeah, <laughs> that seems to be the highlight of the show for some reason. I don't know why. Well, um, look, it's like you've been looking at my script already. Right. I, I said here, literally, you've had a couple of excellent guests on your show. They went over very well and, in fact, may have stolen the show in some yeah. way, shape or form. And I'll skip the first person and go to me, Mr Mustard, and ask you, who is that man? Yes. Um, yes, he's John Alexander Mustard. Yes. With well, no photo. <laughs> no, with no photograph, that, as yet. There must be one somewhere. Yeah. Before this tour began, I did a couple of open rehearsals and I invited a lot of people whose opinion, who I know personally and whose opinion is important to me. Mm-hmm. And, I, uh, and I, the show was running particularly long then. It was over three hours. And it obviously had to be cut and I wasn't sure where to cut it. So I invited everyone at these two rehearsals to give me their honest feedback, to not hold back, to tell it just straight and I wouldn't be insulted. I just wanted to know where the show was strong, where it was weak, where they fell asleep, where they lost their concentration, where they wondered what I was talking about, and in particular where it could be cut. Mm. And um, 
I had a few people say you could cut Mr. Mustard. And so I considered cutting it. But it turned out that every, on every show, that was, that all, it got great laughs every night. And also afterwards, people would say that was the highlight. It was worth coming on. And the tweets mostly are about that element of it. And it all goes back to the fact that I found an interview with John Lennon in which he said that he got the Me, Mr. Mustard song from a newspaper. Uh, and being that we know he wrote it in Rishikesh because it's on the Isha demos, uh, I assumed it was in the newspaper perhaps just before they left England, February 68, maybe January. And it was to my surprise that I had to go back as far as June 67 before I found it. Mm. Um, but then, as I say in the show, me being me, it's just like, well, who was this man? What, was, what is the story here? There's the newspaper piece. I now know it was about a divorce. Uh, and it was, a, it was the reports of a divorce case that John read about this Mr. Mustard being particularly mean. <laughs> Um, but in the end, I just thought, well, I'll just keep going and got his birth certificate, his death certificate, his will, um, found out what he did for a living, found his name in a couple of, in, a, in, a, in an old book and found the house where he lived, where he was especially mean to his second wife, mm. uh, showed a picture of the house. And I did actually write to the occupant of the bungalow now in Enfield in North London and ask uh, if I could go in it and take photographs but I didn't get a reply. Oh, okay. And at one point early on, I was actually thinking of making a comedy sketch out of that bit <laughs> and having, because uh, I know some comedians and actually having them act in it. Wow. Someone act the part of Mustard. I'm now glad I didn't do that, but that was my original thought. I mean, it's amazing that, and, and I'm with you, it was a, a marvellous highlight. It did get right. the great laughs in the show that I heard. Yeah. And I love the bit where... You, you, and I, I don't want to give it away, but we will. You will have finished the shows by the time we air some of this. Yeah. Uh, where I think you said, and in, in his will to his dear wife, it may not have been a, a term of endearment. <laughs> yes. But it might have been more of reflection on on how much money she was costing him. <laughs> yes. Absolutely love My that. dear wife. Yes. I thought that was the gold moment. Yes. So congratulations. That's comedy writing. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. Well, I've I've written books about comedy and comedians, so yeah. I, um, I've seen enough of them over the yeah. years. But yeah. you need a laugh in a show, yeah, especially exactly. a long show. Um, and I have another laugh as well, which is where I connect photographs of the Beatles with old ladies. Yeah, oh, that's so good. Mm. I love that. And it, it, it also goes to show, uh, to emphasise to audiences, just how uh, amenable the Beatles were in real life to meeting members of the public mm. and how there was no security around them in the way that we would now expect people to be, you know, cordoned off by big beefy guys, yeah. you know, who eat protein powder yeah. for breakfast you know <laughs> in those days when the Beatles are shooting the Abbey Road cover shoot on the zebra crossing and they're standing on the side waiting for Macmillan to say ready go again mm. you could just go up and talk to them yeah. and that's what that picture captures and that therefore tells a story in its own right totally and, a, and the best story yeah yeah have you come any Possibly. closer to the understanding of why John might have had that in his mind when he was in Rishikesh rather than writing something like that back in June or thereabouts in 67? Mm. We know the theory, but has it actually turned up the newspaper? In yeah, Rishikesh, no. no. The, uh, the only thing I say in the show, and it's pure speculation, there was no evidence for this at all, is that he may have wrapped something precious mm. on the journey because of the long flight from London to, mm. to Delhi. He may have wrapped something in, a, in an old newspaper and then just smoothed it out when he got there and seen the mustard piece by yeah. complete chance. Yeah. It could be, however, that he'd actually had the song in his mind from the previous June, mm. from Pepper Time, when he saw it. I can't imagine he would have just retained that story in his head for eight no, months. No, it, well, it wasn't that engaging a piece. I mean, no. it was a funny little thing you'd read in a paper, but the next day you'd read something else and forget the previous one. Well, inspired by... John Alexander Mustard, inspired by John Lennon, inspired by Mark Lewis and Let It Be Beatles, did The Road to Abbey Road and me, Mr Mustard, travel all that way from June 67 right through to the yeah. Abbey Road album and yes. skipped two whole albums. Yes. Amazingly. Yes, that's right. Well, thank, we wouldn't know, I don't, th well, I suppose now we would know it anyway, but the Isha demos yeah. was the first realisation for many of us that he had actually written that much earlier than we And had a complete song. Yeah, it differs yeah. very complete, little. complete in its yeah. shortness, yeah. as is Polythene Pam. Yeah. Um, and I tell the Polythene Pam stories as well. Well, it's a perfect segue because mm. Polythene Pam of Liverpool. And yes, for the benefit Pat. of Mark, who will see this, and I'm sure for your listeners at home, we will um, post a photograph of this. But I'm showing Mark 
a catalogue which I got in March 1996, an auction in Melbourne, yes. Christie's, that came up more recently in topic because of a very famous photograph of George Harrison with a, a 1959 photo of George. But oh, I know that I one. want to show you, Mark, that, oh, and you may well have that. Yes. This is the original printing, you're going to hold it. Mm. A catalogue with a photograph of a, a photo album that purportedly is owned by Pat Hodgetts. Yes. She's in the Windsor Hotel in Liverpool. Yes. It's her full street address. Her parents ran that hotel. Yeah. And a photo is pasted diligently in the front cover as if it is her and George Harrison. Mm. And I look at the photo and it looks like a shiny black coat, like it might have been polythene. Mm -hmm. Is that Pat Hodgetts? I thought it was. I mean, that you would... 999 people out of a thousand would mm. come to that conclusion. Mm. It's her autograph book. It's her. She's written her name and address inside the front cover and pasted a picture of her and George. And the obvious assumption is it's her. But um, there's a, a lovely woman in Liverpool called Margaret Price, who was an, another Cavanite uh, and would write to George when the Beatles were in Hamburg. And George would write back. And I quote her letters in Tune In, and uh, or his letters to her. Mm. And she knew Pat very well and said to me, but that isn't Pat. Yeah, right, that's, that's astounding. So I was then on the hunt for a picture of Pat, having assumed it to be this one, yeah. and I never found another one. And so. I've always long assumed. Uh, there is a picture of John, Paul and George at the back of Paul's house yes. in late 62, uh, and that was taken by Pat, but she's not in it. And then there's a, another picture that same day of the Beatles, three of the Beatles with two girls, and I assume one of them had to be Pat, and I sent it to Margaret and said, is one of these then Pat? And she said, nope. <laughs> so she drew a drawing, made a drawing of, of Pat's face as best she remembered it, but um, wow. I couldn't exactly show that. Okay. And That's she's dead. Him. Pat is now dead, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about Polythene Pam, as she's called, just to, in so much of what you've been telling the audience in your shows. Yes, well, because this, polyth this, this woman, this girl, young girl, Pat Hodgetts in Liverpool, um, well, what would she have been about? 17, maybe. Uh, because she chewed polythene, the Beatles called her polythene pat. Mm. She just liked to chew it for yeah. reasons that I do not know. Um, but just one of those affectations. She used to burn it under a flame when it was charred and then chew it. Very strange thing. Very strange. Potentially poisonous, I wouldn't have thought. But anyway. Um, so th because she, the Beatles knew her as polythene pat, that was in John's head. Yeah. But then, as John explained it, I think to Playboy magazine just before he was killed, um, there was also an incident in Guernsey in the Channel Islands off the coast of, well, it's a, a British islands off the coast of France. Mm -hmm. uh, in August 63, the Beatles played one night in Guernsey. And working in Guernsey that summer was the beat poet Royston Ellis, who the Beatles knew from 1960 when they backed him in the Jacaranda coffee bar while he read his poetry. Uh, and also then Royston went back to Gambia Terrace and that was the night when he showed them how they could get high by um, chewing the inside of a Vic inhaler, which was a piece of yeah. like cardboard that had was soaked in benzodrine. And he, if you break open a Vic inhaler and chew that piece of cardboard, it gives you a high. That was the first time they ever got high. Wow. And it's quite an important night. Uh, because it also set the tone in that John went straight for it, George went straight for it, and Paul held back. And that's exactly how it would remain, like, for example, with LSD. Mm. Um, and, and that's not a criticism of Paul. It's no bad thing to hold back from drugs, yeah. on the contrary. Um, but that, that pattern it was, would be repeated, and that's why this first story is particularly important. And um, so Royston was there in 63, and he and John... Had a, they palled up at the end of that gig and Royston knew of a young woman who would do a threesome. Royston was bisexual and John was, I think, openly sexual. I think he was just open to experiences and Royston knew of this woman uh, who would do a threesome. And they went to bed and she wore pa uh, plastic of some kind, polythene or plastic or PVC. Royston told me it was a bin liner, which I can't quite get my head around. But nonetheless, something happened that night and when John who was always candid in his interviews, um, was talking to Playboy, he remembered that night and said that the song was about that. Okay. Mm. Yeah, right. Well, that's very interesting. And early experiences, again, Yeah. throwing up in 19... Well, essentially May 1968 or thereabouts. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, so it's, it's five years on or so, yeah. um, and indeed from the Cavern period even longer it's before just... John wrote the song. 
again, it just shows you that the, the Beatles story is not one-dimensional no. at all. No, but it's much deeper. And in, I mean, in tune in. Uh, there are a lot of seeds sown in that book for things that will flower in books two and three. Yes. And, and I mentioned Pat Hodgetts and her interest in chewing polythene, but I'd stopped there. Yeah, yeah. I didn't mention that John would write a song one day yeah. because that's the kind of thing I'm eager to avoid. Yeah, you know, avoid yeah, doing. Indeed, yes, mm. yes. I think you said in another interview recently, um, little did they know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly, yes. <laughs> Five years later. This is John know that five years later he'd write a song. Well, your last Hornsey Road show is in a be in retrospect when we air this. Given that it's coming to a close, how do you feel about it? I'm very glad to have done it. I'm quite glad that it's finishing. There has been a lot of uh, inquiry from America in particular, and actually Australia as well. And I still have a, an offer on the table for Australia all right. that I haven't fully responded to. Wow. First of all, um, during the course of this tour, I've, I've, I've had to strike an arrangement with um, Apple Corps about how many more times I do this show. <laughs> yeah, okay. They have um, allowed me to include all the things that I include, and they've allowed me to continue and conclude the tour uninterrupted, but they wouldn't want me to just keep doing it uh, willy-nilly um, without reference to them. Does and that I, include I, I, music? It, because the content, I, my argument is that I, I use everything in a historical context, that this is a lecture, uh, and that I don't keep anything on screen for very long, but obviously there is a lot of copyrighted content in it, and um, I can't, you know, I have, I've been sensitive to how I use it, but their view of what I've used and my view of what I've used slightly differs, and I've had to concede that um, I need to be, you know, more circumspect in the way I go forward with this. So it could well be that I can't tour it anywhere yes. else, but actually I probably won't anyway for the simple reason that I've got books to write and not everything can go everywhere. And it would be nice if I could take it everywhere, but that would monopolize the first half of next year yes. for me. And I really do have to go on with the books. Uh, I would like, I mean, ideally, I mean, the more money I get, the longer I can continue uninterrupted on the book. Mm. I mean, I don't lead an expensive lifestyle, but just life is expensive yeah, generally, totally. just to keep putting food on the table and pay the bills. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I must focus on the books. I really must. Well, let's move on to September 1969. And I think we might have been somewhat closer to that topic of the, um, the Apple Beatles boardroom tape yeah. in what you just talked about. And maybe I'm wrong. Can we talk about that at all? Yes. I may have this date wrong, but certainly the 8th of September 1969. Mm. Uh, John Lennon, Paul McCartney, George Harrison at Apple having a, a Beatles boardroom meeting. Ringo Starr's away sick the day, so John records it. And they have a conversation about many things, but the point that I would like, and I've heard a little bit of the tape myself, mm. dividing up the albums, John making a, a statement at the boardroom meeting saying, dividing up the albums, there'll be um, four songs each, two for Ringo if he wants it, and that's it, settled. Yes. That was the... the John saying, well, that's what's happening. Yes. Minute that. Yes. And a single and getting, before Christmas. And, and getting their agreement on it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a meeting at which they discuss things. He's not laying down the law. But here is a very strong suggestion that is pretty much the way it has to be. Mm. And it goes through. It goes through. It just seemed to go through unchallenged. Yes. Yeah. Paul is, is, Paul is very... I haven't heard the whole tape either. Mm. And I'm, I'm longing to. I mean, I, I must hear it. Yeah. I absolutely must hear it for, for volume three. Uh, maybe volume two as well. But nonetheless, um, I haven't heard all of it. But in the bits that I have heard, Paul is very quiet. Mm. Um, the, the article on me on, and on this tour that was in The Guardian about that majored on that tape, which is how it came to be a bit of a news story yeah. back in September. Uh, Richard Williams, the Richard Williams from Melody Maker Days, who wrote that article in The Guardian, said that Paul sounded under the influence of some herbal substances, yeah. and, and he probably is. He sounds a little bit subdued. He's not his usual bullish self. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 uh, and also the things he says, um, they're, a little bit, uh, they're a little bit off the wall, where John is very focused, and mm. it, it's instructive to hear that right at the very end of the Beatles, although obviously in their minds it wasn't yet the end, but right at the very end of the Beatles, as it would be, that John is still very much the one who's giving them direction. 
um, and which goes to confirm for me that when John stepped down, as he did in 66, 67, 8, or 67, certainly when Paul came to the forefront, giving the Beatles direction, that John could still take that back if he wanted to. Yeah. And when he stepped forward, he was back in that position again. Because we're talking here about human relationships and the, the way that friends interact mm. and the dynamic that exists between different people. Um, you can step back into a role when you choose to, if you want to. And, and others will step back if you do. I mean, yeah. that's typical of all our friendships and relationships in yes, life. Yes, that's right. You can cruise a bit and let somebody else take the lead for a while, but yes. it's always your bus. Yeah. A very good way of putting it. Very good, yes. So um, it's September the 9th, actually. Richard Williams in The Guardian called it the 8th in error, and that's how it's gone around now as the 8th. But it was the 9th. It was 9969, and it was at Savile Row, and uh, Ringo was in hospital for, with uh, just under observation um, for a problem with his intestines. He wasn't kept in for long. Mm. He's forgotten about that hospitalisation because when he did an interview with the BBC recently, he said, I was in hospital in 69. Oh, I don't think so, okay. but he was. Yeah. Um, and in fact, um, there's a, an account of John and Yoko visiting him in hospital. One of the relationships in the Beatles that no one ever talks about that is absolutely fundamental to their um, cohesiveness is John and Ringo's friendship. Mm. John and Ringo were extremely close from the start to the end. Mm. They really were. Um, George had a great relationship with Ringo, but John and Ringo's relationship was magical. And um, John records this for Ringo. I That's mean, right. you yes. know, uh, because he couldn't be there. And that tape is around, and I've got four and a half minutes of yeah. it. And uh, do we think it's 50 something minutes? Yes, 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 I believe so. And yeah. it's been quoted at length uh, in the Anthony Fawcett yeah. book. If you want to know yeah. most about that tape, find that yeah. book. And, and it's in one or two other places as well. But really, that is the primary knowledge of it, mm. that, that book. Um, I was accused by um, certain people of coming up with a tape that they didn't know existed and mentioning it to a newspaper without them even knowing anything about it. And my response was, but it's been quoted at length in, an, in, in a Lennon-endorsed book because One Day at a Time by Anthony Fawcett was endorsed by John and Yoko. It was done with their blessing. Mm. And uh, I couldn't know that they didn't know that. And it reminded a lot of people about that book. And there's what several pages book? of it. Yeah. Several pages. And so, yeah, so the, the, the thing about 14 tracks is that the Beatles always had 14 in their mind. I, I realised this a few years ago that when they're making an album, whenever they made an album, if they had done, say, 10 tracks, they would always say, oh, we've got four to go. Mm -hmm. It's because Please Please Me had 14 and With The Beatles had 14. A Hard Day's Night had 13, but that's because the final session didn't happen because Ringo wasn't there. Yeah. Otherwise, that would have yeah, had 14. True. Beatles for Sale had 14. Rubber Soul had 14. Revolver had 14. So in their minds, an album is 14. Yep. Abbey Road had 17 because some of them are short. Mm -hmm. But so when he's saying how we divided up, it's four plus four plus four and two for Ringo if he wants them, which is fine. Which that would have taken up had he not. I guess so, yes. yes. Very good. But they're not shortchanging Ringo because obviously he's barely writing yet. Yeah. But even still, they're giving him two if he wants them, yeah. um, which is great. And I did read somebody say, what a disastrous idea that would have been. But why, why would it have been why? disastrous? It, it would not have been disastrous. Yeah. It would have been four great Lennon songs, four great McCartney yeah. songs, and four great Harrison songs. And, and the other point of the tape that struck me is how John took to Paul about the songs that he didn't dig. Yeah. Um, and I'll just read a little bit out. Yeah. John, talking about Maxwell and Obla Dee Blada, you didn't really uh, like them yourself. Give them to people who would like songs like that. Give them to them. Nobody dug them, not even the guy that wrote them. Yeah. So John had a very strong sense of what an album was about. Yes. Versus singles. He talks about those songs being more for singles. Yes. If you wanted that type of song. Yes. The prelude to what John said, it must have been a couple of days earlier, because he's, John is referencing something that Paul had told to him a couple of days earlier, that he didn't rate Maxwell Silverhammer or Obla Dee Obla Da very highly either. And John has obviously been thinking about this for a couple of days, saying, oh, yeah, we, we hated those tracks. We really, really didn't enjoy the experience, even though John wasn't on Maxwell. Yeah. He knew that George and Ringo had hated it, so on their behalf, he's saying, we really didn't enjoy what you put us through on those mm. two songs. And now for you to say you didn't really rate them very highly either, so why the hell did we do that? Why did you make us do that? Yeah. Why did you put us through something that even you weren't that passionate about? Mm. 
And Paul must have said it would be to make the album popular because there would be popular songs. I mean, Obla Di Obla Da has this reputation now that we know about, but in reality, it is a great song mm. and it was a number one single for the Marmalade. Uh, and it was, it's in the Beatles canon of great songs. Yeah. But uh, evidently, Paul had kind of put it, planted it in those albums because he knew it would be a kind of popular number. Mm. And John is saying to him, albums don't have to be that. If you want to put those tracks out as a single, okay, because singles market is slightly different. Yeah. There had been this devolution of singles album, uh, singles market and album market, hadn't there, in the late 60s. And the Beatles had been at the forefront of that, of course, by not including their singles on their albums. And um, why didn't we just do it as a single, or why didn't you give it to Mary or someone who yeah. needs a song like that? Why did you make us do it? if you didn't even really rate it yourself. <laughs> exactly. It's revelatory to hear yeah. that. And it's also revelatory to hear the even-tempered way that John says this to Paul. Mm. He's not shouting. Mm. He's not even angry. He's just perplexed. It's just like, you made us do this thing and you didn't really believe in it either. But the other bits of it, I'm obliged only to talk about them, not actually to quote them. One of them is um, John saying to Paul, we don't need to put Lennon and McCartney on all our songs anymore. That's a big one. Yeah, that is a big one. So had there been another Beatles album, it not only would have had George with an equal share, but the Lennon-McCartney credit would have been finished. And do you think that's to do with John's songs now being the, you know, what a shame Mary Jane might have been one of them. Uh, you know, my name might not have been one, but it could have been. Certainly Cold Turkey, Give mm -hmm. Peace a Chance. Yeah. Are they the songs that John's got in his mind that couldn't possibly be anybody but John Lennon? Um, I don't know what he had in his mind. I, in the show, I kind of slightly make light of it by saying, which is true, that Paul's name is credited as co-composer of Give Peace a Chance, and obviously he had nothing to do with it. Yeah. Um, and John's name is credited as co-composer of Maxwell Silver Hammer, <laughs> which he probably didn't want his name on that track. You know, why can't it just say McCartney? Why must his name be on this thing he really doesn't like? Yeah. And it, it probably just brought him up to think, we, why are we continuing this thing? It was only ever an informal arrangement. It was never in writing. They even, it's fascinating because John actually says, you know, we'd have to clear it with uh, Northern Songs. And at that time, Northern, they just lost control of Northern Songs yeah. to ATV, like that week. Yeah. And, but there's no bitterness. No. We'll just have to clear it with them, check it's all right with them, mm. he's saying. You know, they, 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 they were quite moral people, the Beatles. Very much so. And, mm. and, the, and the conversation, as you say, Paul is very subdued, except for the point where he does yeah. say, I've been thinking until this album that George's songs weren't that good. Incredibly, George just very calmly, very relaxed, yeah. responds and said, well, well, that's again a matter of taste. They have been liked. Yes, yes. But I would have been down his throat. Yes. And George, who had been at school, someone who was prepared to use his fists, um, in earlier years may have jumped up and punched him on the nose. Because yeah. uh, it was a very strong remark. Mm. Basically saying, I've not rated any of your things until it's now. a horrible thing to say. Yeah. So maybe he was under the influence and we, the others could see that he wasn't. You're sure. Perhaps. <laughs> perhaps. But at the age of just 26, George is wise enough to just go, well, you know, that's just your opinion. Mm. Uh, and there are other opinions uh, who think differently. Yeah, yeah. Um, but what a thing to say. And, and, and when, to, when you think that he's talking about While My Guitar Gently Weeps, which Paul greatly enhanced it, the recording of. I mean, While My Guitar Gently Weeps is a great George Harrison song mm. and would have been great in any way. But the recording that we know and love has a lot of McCartney in it. The piano at the beginning is yeah. Paul. The harmony vocal by Paul yeah. throughout While My Guitar Gently Weeps is fantastic. Incredible. And um, he, he gifted that song with his own melodies. Mm. And yet, a year later, he's telling George he didn't really rate it. <laughs> he's forgotten that one. Yeah. Clearly. And he's also speaking, therefore, of Blue Jay Way, of Within You, Without You, of Taxman, of If yeah. I Needed Someone, you know, yeah. I Want to Tell You, and... Mm. Um, Piggies. Piggies yeah. and Savoy yeah. Truffle. Yeah, yeah. it's an amazing thing to say. Yeah. But what a measure, again, an insight into how honest they could be with one another. And that is instructive. It should be instructive to all people who follow the Beatles, certainly to me as the writer of the history. You know, in 2019, we've now had the internet for 20 years or so, been common in our lives for this century so far. And as a consequence of all of that, 
I do, my eyes do fall upon when I look at web pages a lot of complete drivel that people who don't know what they're talking about but think they do, um, who pick up, as, as the rut will say, pick up the wrong end of the stick and begin to beat about the bush with it. There's a lot of that these days. And I think that all these people could do themselves a favour and spend more time listening to the Beatles speaking mm. and to reading their interviews. Uh, even on paper, if you can't hear their voice, if they're good, properly transcribed interviews. Because people are beginning to forget the way they thought, and they're beginning to apply their thinking to the way the Beatles must have thought. And no, they didn't. They didn't. Well, that, that use of that board tape, is, as little as you were allowed, was very insightful. Yeah. Because it, it just absolutely paints a different picture. And, and these four guys, they went through all of that. Yes. And yet in September 1969, that close to perhaps what is their finish line. Yeah. Are so casual about it. Yes. They're so intuitive with each other. Yes. Albeit saying some rather crummy things. Yes. In terms of Paul to George. Yes, yes. You know, it's quite remarkable. You hear in January 69, there's a couple of references just kind of almost tossed away about them breaking up, mm. which makes you realise they've been, they've been talking about it before this, because mm. these aren't, aren't first mentions. You can tell they're not first mentions. Yeah. And it's like, well, so they were thinking about it in 68 then. And I think the world was much more upset with the Beatles' breakup than they were themselves. <laughs> they had difficulties with it over how they moved beyond it. But nonetheless, I think they were all accepting of it on, on, on the main level mm. that it could happen one day and, and would happen one day. And, you know, the world was very upset because they never wanted them to break up. But the, the four people concerned, I think, were much more accepting of it. Well, let's change gears completely. Yeah. Or if you'd like, now for something completely different, right. I suppose. Yeah. George is living in the Material World book, or the Harrison's book, that came out with his um, major documentary, the Martin Scorsese film. Yes. Uh, gave birth to some wonderful archives. And yes. And there was in the book a letter that George wrote to his sister Louise on 29th of June 1963. Yes. Which I've given a copy to Mark, just taken from the book. A couple of things in there, very interesting. Um, when we last spoke, we were talking about Louise Harrison being in Benton, Illinois, trying to drive a little bit of early yes. business for the Beatles, the unknown Beatles um, in the United States, and that George refers to sending her a dozen copies of From Me To You with VJ for USA sticker stuck over the top of Parlophone. I don't know if you can see that in the middle of page yes. one there. Yes. Towards the bottom. Could so, it possibly be? Yes, that? let's just read this. So he says, I've arranged for our music publisher, that's Dick James, mm. to send about one dozen copies of From Me To You, so they should reach you shortly after this letter. They will have British Parlophone label on with something like VJ for USA stuck over it. Mm. So they should be okay. We can't do anything about that and we must have our records released through the EMI outlets in the US. So that's why we are on VJ. Still, I believe it is quite a good company and they do have a lot of hit records on that label. Yeah. Yeah. That is fascinating, isn't it? It so, is fascinating. Um, it, I don't think there's any question there. It's just a, a yes. you know, just discussing that as a concept. And I've never heard of one of those records turning up. I've never seen a stickered copy. No, oh, a, parlophone, no. a Parlophone label British from me to you with VJ for USA yeah, stuck on yeah. it or something to that effect. That may have been some kind of a legal thing. Mm. I can't think why, since Dick James was sending them only to an individual. Yes. But nonetheless, oh, it may have simply been so that when she gave them out to broadcasters, say, or journalists, that they would know that the Beatles actually weren't on Parlophone in the US, yes. they were on VJ in the yes. US. Yeah. But I've never seen one of the records. No, the next critical point is on page two, and it's numbered one. Yeah. This is in June 29, 1963. Yes. We will be topping the bill on the London Palladium in September, yeah. which is nearly everyone's professional ambition. When I read that, I just about fell off my bloody chair. Right. Because we all know the Beatles appeared on Sunday night at London Palladium in yeah. October, in fact, on October 13, 1963, and give or take... September, October, just for a little bit of scheduling. Yes. Perhaps by Val Parnell and the Sunday night television program. That George Harrison knew in June that they were going to headline Sunday night London Palladium. Yes. Is that Brian's influence again that he could get them on the top of the bill? Yes. Months ahead. The first thing is that, um, well, the inquiry, yes, I, I think I have an even earlier reference to the Palladium being, mm. being in their diary earlier than June. 
But things like this are, are wonderful because they, Brian had evidently told them, and um, um, of course he would too, that they were not only going to be on the Palladium but topping the bill. Topping the bill was a Brian Epstein thing. Merely getting them on the show would not have been what Brian was after. He didn't just want the Beatles to get on the Ed Sullivan show, he wanted them to top the bill on the Ed Sullivan show. There's a big difference. And Brian was savvy enough to know that. Brian mm. is so maligned in people don't understand the way he managed the Beatles at all. They didn't only appear on Sullivan, they topped the bill. They didn't only appear on the Palladium, they topped the bill. Or Brian wouldn't have had them on the show. But obviously the shock for you is that this was evident as well as early as late June, and therefore perhaps earlier still. And there is a reference I found somewhere else to them being on the Palladium show um, coming up in the autumn. There was yeah. an early summer reference to them but being on what, in the autumn. What surprised me the most is that I everyone... You know, for American listeners out there, that the, the Sunday night at London Palladium is the UK's version of the Ed Sullivan Show. There's it no is. question that that's the yes. biggest variety show at its time. Yes, that it just wasn't Val Parnell as a television producer getting the Beatles quick, get them on. They're really popular. We've got to get them on next week or next two weeks. This was well planned by clearly mm. Brian Epstein. Yes, not the other way around. Yes. Brian would, they would have been in negotiation with Brian from the late spring, probably, mm. to have the Beatles on, because they were, they were making a lot of noise, the Beatles. Mm. Um, because Beatlemania, Fleet Street-wise, tends to be tagged to the Palladium appearance yep. in October, there is constantly this assumption that prior to October, they're merely building up to that moment. Yes. Uh, which is true in a sense, there is something to that. But the reality is that if you worked in the business of British entertainment, if you ran clubs, put on entertainment, ran TV or radio programmes in 1963, you would have been aware of the Beatles from about January. Mm. Um, because they were making a lot of noise in a, in a very unusual way. In fact, I, I even say in Tune In that it was happening in late 62, yep. that people were sitting up and taking notice. Because Love Me Do, though it only peaked at 17, hung around on the charts for three months. Mm. And people were, oh, God, that record is just still selling and still selling and still selling. And everywhere they went, manage, management of clubs or venues would want them back. Mm. And the word got around very quickly that there's something was cooking here. And um, Val Parnell's name was on that show. It wasn't really Val. It was really... Um, it was really Lou Grade's office who were okay. booking that show. And Lou Grade's office were on to the Beatles from March 63 or thereabouts. Um, so I'm not surprised. Yeah. But it's great to have George actually confirming it. And the fact that they're topping the bill. Yeah, I love it. It's yes. one of the great letters. It is, it is. Every letter has its value. <laughs> it's also great to see here that um, George saying, we believe, or I believe, that VJ is quite a good company. Yeah because VJ is always underplayed as being, you know, a small fry label compared to the mighty capital. VJ would have been a comfortable home for the Beatles. And although they didn't have such a great distribution network, with the sales being as great as they were, they would have found a way to get them distributed properly. Mm -hmm. And um, they could have been big on VJ and it wouldn't have been bad for the Beatles to be on a really hot little black R&B label. Yeah, exactly. Much more hip than capital. On page two of the letter for those at home that are reading along with us. Um, yeah. Our long playing record has been and still is number one in the LP charts. Incidentally, it has sold more copies in Great Britain than anything else since yes. the South Pacific soundtrack. Yeah. That's, that's quite a, an achievement. It's, it's um, the biggest selling LP since that particular yes. soundtrack record of um, a famous movie, I think. Yes, yeah. South Pacific, the musical and then mm. the film, was a perennial bestseller on the album charts, mm. the pre-Beatles. Mm. Uh, and indeed, even post-Beatles, The Sound of Music was probably the biggest album of the 60s. Sound yeah. of Music was out of the top of the charts for years. Yep either number one or number two or number three, but it was it was constantly there. And we're talking about Please Please Me here in June mm. 1963. It's Which, your only album. It's been out three months. Yeah. Um, and the other, in, well, the, the first thing that that tells me, and, and this is again context that may not be appreciated in 2019, he's talking about the LP chart. The LP chart, the LP before the Beatles, was principally a medium for... Uh, more mature music for more mature people. The LP as a record cost more money to buy. Yep. 
The single was just about affordable for kids. Kids could barely afford an album. So the LP chart naturally was populated with records aimed at the older buyer, not teenage buyers, but people who were more discerning, who would buy the musical, the soundtrack of a musical, or the soundtrack of a film, or an opera, mm -hmm. or something, or, a, or some kind of a show. So what George is saying there is that this is the biggest selling teenager album mm -hmm. ever mm -hmm. already in three months. Because yeah, it sure. isn't kids buying South Pacific, <laughs> it's, it's adults. Yep. Um, who've got a gramophone yeah. and will sit in their tie and jacket of an evening and put on a gramophone record for their Remember entertainment. Well. Yeah. Whereas Please Please Me is already up there or, or you know, the biggest selling since that. He's basically saying it's the biggest selling rock era album ever and it's only been out three months. It's um, quite an achievement and he's yeah. so proudly pointing that out to his yes. sister. This is the news. Yes. It's fantastic. And that news would come from... EMI um, sales department to George Martin mm. and then either probably via Brian to the Beatles or maybe straight to the Beatles when Brian when George sees them mm. um, but they're hearing it when they they have their if they go because they're mostly on the road so they have a session and George Martin tells them and by the way boys you know I've heard from the sales force that your record mm -hmm. is the biggest selling record since South Pacific or it goes via Brian so wonderful that yeah. I mean th these things actually um they wouldn't remember the detail later. If George hadn't written this down, it would not be preserved now. That's right. And that's the beauty of letters, especially with a date on them. And in this case, the stationery of a hotel in Birmingham, the yeah. Albany Hotel. They're on the road. Um, when would they have played there? They played Birmingham Town Hall, didn't they, on the Roy Orbison tour? It might be that tour. The, when they were, or maybe they were just in the locality and yeah. stayed in Birmingham. But yeah. yeah. Well, it's my most favourite letter, yes. particularly because of my interest in the Beatles. Australian tour. Yes. This is a letter dated um, the 14th of October 1963. Ken, uh, from Cyril Berlin, the agent that would act on behalf of the Australian promoter Ken Brodziak and Dick Lean from the Stadium's Proprietary Limited, who would bring the Beatles to Australia. So Cyril writes to Ken, I was at the Palladium yesterday to see the Beatles who topped the bill on the Sunday Night London Palladium TV show. In which program I also had Des O'Connor, so Cyril was representing Des O'Connor. Yes. Just this next bit is the, what I just wanted to touch on briefly. I don't think I have ever in all my years in the business seen such scenes of enthusiasm by the youngsters who were quite ecstatic and also the acclamation of grown-ups. Up until now, I've had an open mind about this group, but after seeing them at work and meeting them personally, and here's the gotcha, I have not the slightest doubt that this is the most exciting and interesting group this country has ever had and will undoubtedly become internationally famous. Now, this is one of those rare letters where somebody said, I knew they were great. Yes. This guy actually wrote it down at the time. Yes. This and and he's what, writing that he hadn't, he had an open mind on yeah. them until this moment. And he's a seasoned theatre promoter, yes. agent. Yes. This is not a young teenager writing this. This is a, an agent who's seen a, probably at all. This is a man steeped in show business. Yes. And yes. it's before Sweden. They hadn't toured anywhere. Yes. Apart from going and slogging it out in... German clubs. There really has never been anything quite like their phenomenal success in this country and you can rest assured that they will steadily become more popular in Australasia and be quite sensational if and when they play there. Mm. Yes. So Cyril Berlin was an, had originally been an independent agent. He, would then, he was then um, taken over by the grade organisation, Lou and Leslie Grade. Mm -hmm. 14th of October, so this is sometime on the Monday, maybe even Monday morning, mm -hmm. he gets into the office and dictates this letter to his secretary uh, the morning after the Palladium show. That's right. And he's been there and he's witnessed it and he's met them in person and obviously the Beatles were dynamic in mm -hmm. person. I mean, they were unlike anybody else because they didn't take any shit from anybody, but they were also not belligerent with it. Mm -hmm. they, were, they were just themselves and they knew where they were going. And they've got a rocket under them by this point, by October 63, where they've had it the whole... Well, they've had a rocket under them since December 1960. And now, at this point, it's absolutely firing them up. Yes, I, I too love letters like this, and I intend to quote this letter in the mm. book, because uh, they are in such demand throughout Europe and are receiving as absolutely astronomical fees. And I, have had, I had great difficulty in my discussion with Brian Epstein to convince him that he should take them to Australia and New Zealand. Mm. So they're getting good fees as well, and yeah. Brian knows their value. 
And Brian is the manager of this hottest of properties by, by this point. It's a brilliant letter. And that they could easily pick up £400 per night. Yeah. It's quite a lot of money. Yes, <laughs> yes. It, it would seem not in the, in, in the fullness of time, but in its moment, mm. of course it was. Mm. Mm. I found a letter just the other day uh, from March 63 that the Beatles are already for one night stands in March if you wanted to book the Beatles there on 250 a night. Yeah. Well, the only way that most venues could um, pay 250 a night is to put the price up to like double the admission price of what it usually is. So promoters were a little bit reticent to do that. Yeah. But they, when they did it, the public still came. Last but not least in the um, show and tell is a letter dated undated on the letter, but almost certainly sometime in December 1963. Yes. Um, you and I, when we, um, when we caught up in August last year, yes. you happened to mention the name of a lady that George Harrison's mother was writing to, a lady by the name of Gwen, and as we corresponded after, through your mentions and the clues that you're able to provide, we, we found her daughter, Mavis, who was a a 14-year-old in 1964 and was still uh, the proud custodian of a, a number of those correspondence between her mum, Gwen, and George's mum, Louise. And we have one of them in front of us. And I just wanted to quickly touch on the fact that this is a letter to Gwen. They've clearly been corresponding for years and just talking about their kids. And, and this is the, the thing that struck me about this letter. My youngest son, 20, is now top of all the pop stars. He has been in the Beatles for a few years now, and I'm sure you will have heard their records. I hear that Australia had a Beatle Day last Sunday in November. They go to the USA in February, and are due to visit South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand during 1964. Mm. So the thing that's two things that struck me about that how he doesn't get called George, he's just son <laughs> twenty because yes. there was other people in their lives and it was easier to describe them that way I think yes that you might have heard that my son 20 is now top of all the pop stars I mean has there ever been an understatement yeah there is one there because this would be about December 63 wouldn't yes it? I would think so mm. uh, what a wonderful letter to write to a, a pen pal that your yes. son is a member of the Beatles yes or anything in your research that they may have been talking about visiting South Africa because it clearly must have been on the agenda at yes it was yeah. it was they wouldn't have gone it it's a curious one South Africa because I've got quite a few references I've got a trail of reports of South Africa being on the horizon in 1964 yeah. um, but in reality, I, don't, I, I, I can't quite, I've never been able yet to square why there were discussions about it because mm. the Beatles were members of the Musicians' Union. Right. And already by 1963, 64, the Musicians' Union in Britain had a blockade on any of its members playing in South Africa. Okay. Um, and when a couple of British entertainers did go there, not members of the MU because they were only singers, Adam Faith and Dusty Springfield separately went to South Africa. Both tours ended in disaster. Um, Dusty came back early, there was a lot of controversy about her while she was out there because she didn't want to play to uh, segregated audiences yeah. and obviously the government weren't going to allow her to play to integrated audiences. Mm. Um, so, and the Musicians Union had a blockade on anybody going there. I think actually one of the bands did break the, I've got it all in my notes. Yeah. Uh, and I will be writing about all this. So why they were, there was even discussion of them going there, I don't know. But it did linger for quite a few months. Similarly, there was a possibility of them going to Poland, um, but that never happened. And also to Israel, and that yeah. never happened. Yeah. Uh, and the Israel one might have happened, but for the Israeli government blocking the Beatles coming in. Because they didn't want the youth to be disturbed in the way the that they could see. Yeah, I think it was post... I think it was post-America, all the reports of Beatlemania in America frightened off the Israeli government and just said, we don't want our kids kind of getting all, you know, yeah. hysterical. Well, that is interesting. Yeah, it was probably, again, through the grade office. The grades were the most well-connected show business agency. And although Brian was self-contained with NEMS Enterprises, the grades would offer Brian a shortcut way into certain things. Uh, the yes. Beatles' Ed Sullivan show happens through Lou Grade. And Lou Grade enters the Beatles story in most books as this evil man who takes over Northern songs in 1969. But in fact, he's enabled them to be on the Ed Sullivan show in 64, um, and which was a triumph for the Beatles, yes. of course, uh, as we all know. 
So, but his name is never attached to that. I will be attaching mm, yes. his name to that. As you've made good the names of some other people in the Beatles' yes. life, such as Alan mm. Williams, who got sort of downtrodden over the years, but yes. in fact yes. played a very important early role. Absolutely. Well, so, crucial. Yeah, Absolutely right. crucial, Alan Williams. December 2019. It's this month. Right. Sotheby's auction. Brian Epstein's Decca Records audition. Tape reel number two. Yes. Um, that's coming up for auction this month, and it's a, a five-inch spool of Phillips branded spool of tape, which has, um, I think, seven songs from the Beatles. Decca Records audition. That's correct. And it, fascinating the fact that it quotes your good self, Beatles historian Mark Lewison, has confirmed that this version of the Decca recording is unique. The ending of Three Cool Cats is a single bass note longer than any version we've had before. <laughs> yeah. And not only that, the song, September in the Rain, is four seconds longer than any of the circulated versions as it includes a vocal line that is always edited out. Yes. How fascinating that in 2019, yes. but your private communication to Sotheby's was in 18, that still things can come to light. Yes. That Brian's copy was a unique, different copy. It was. It was. It's sadly not all 15 songs, only mm. seven of them. Uh, but it is the original spool that he was given way, mm. way back in 62. Incredible. And, um, yeah, the, the um, I don't know why the bootleggers back in the 70s, when they got hold of it, the, whether they released everything they had mm. as they received it or whether they made a slight change in order to identify their mm. recording yeah, as being so, unique. Yeah. Fingerprint it. Yeah, yeah. fingerprint it. Yeah. Um, possibly so, but it's these differences are infinitesimal but you found them but they are there <laughs> they are there and they do mark out Brian's tape as being unique and yeah. therefore not a copy of a bootleg would it help us with the order of the performances or has it been compiled it, I, I suspect it's been compiled mm -hmm. that was one of my first questions this tape has been uh, sold by uh, the Epstein family yeah. Epstein family well they're Epsteins actually yeah. uh, in Liverpool uh, the Epstein family they've sold or one of them has sold this tape mm -hmm. and uh when I first, I was in this chap's house when he revealed that he had it, and I was like, oh, what's the order? Yeah. That was the first thing I wanted to know, but you can't really tell. I mean, we, there's an order of these seven songs, but it, you couldn't bank on that. Mm. Could I ask if it's Brian's nephew? Yeah. And must be Clive's son? Correct. Uh, had you, were you able to, had an opportunity to look at other material that might have been held? Yes, yep. yes, yes, I did get to see yep. pretty, pretty much everything that yep. Henry has. Uh, and since then, quite a bit of it has, has come up through memorabilia companies, and I've seen it there. I am going to um, get the listeners' questions, the Ask Mark section Okay, now. let's do that. Um, David Graham from Melbourne has written in, and he wants to know, this is just your opinion, it's very subjective, I guess, but he wants to know what you think. When do you think the Beatles peaked? Oh. Hello, David. Um, when do I think the Beatles peaked? Well, oh. I'm going to bottle it. Yeah. I mean, how do, how do you... Um, everybody's peak is different. And John said the peak as a live band was in the cavern. So that's 61, 62, right? Um, when was their peak as a recording band? 68, 69? Abbey Road is pretty accomplished. Well, every album is accomplished. Yeah. Um, what's their peak as, a, as, um, as, as human beings? <laughs> or as, as, a, as a collective whole? All for the common good. I don't know. I think you've given a pretty good answer there. Yeah. There isn't a single point. There isn't. Everybody's definition is going to be yeah. different, isn't it, of what they have, how they would measure that peak. Mm. Um, I, would, I would always give a shout out for the early days um, because the great tendency to say, well, I like the Beatles mostly from Rubber Soul onwards, means that you deny a hard day's night and with the Beatles and Beatles for sale and please, please me and the singles and yeah. So I think they hit the top and stayed there is actually the, my honest answer of that. I think they hit the top and stayed there from about 61. I think that's a great answer. Mm. It's a good one, David. Thank you for the question. Uh, Dino Jackerman. Dino Jackerman from Sydney, Australia. Is, mm -hmm. he's, he's my three-part question to Mark. In your research, have you ever come across a verified fact that you've hesitated including in your book because it would tarnish the reputation of one or more of the band members 
If so, what criteria do you use as a guide to include or exclude such material? Okay. Yeah. No, I haven't. I haven't excluded anything that I've found if it's relevant to the story. I haven't. So, that may come up at some point and I'll cross that bridge when I get to it, but so far I haven't had to uh, do any kind of censorship. And the third part of Vardino's question is, has there been any pressure placed on you either by remaining band members, estates or associates to suppress such facts? Well, I think we know the mm. partial answer. No. No, no they, 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 they don't... They don't have any involvement in what I do. They don't know what I know. Um, so they've not been in touch to say, don't use this or that. Um, so no, the answer is no. Uh, Dick James seems to be portrayed as a bad guy in the Beatles story. And Elton John portrays him as a Don Arden type character. What do you think he is actually like as a person? And has he been treated unfairly in Beatles history? I think he has been treated unfairly in Beatles history because he appeared to do the dirty on them in... John and Paul, particularly in 1969, by selling his shares in Northern Songs without telling them, which you can understand why they were aggrieved about, most certainly. Um, because of that, uh, he, he, he gets portrayed badly. And I'm not here to attack or defend, but you can certainly understand why John and Paul were really annoyed about that. But it, it does overshadow what he did for them, um, which was a lot. And... The, one or two people who should know better have said, well, what did he do? All he did was publish the songs and rake in the millions. <laughs> um, but he, 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 he was an active part of, of propagating the Beatles around the world. He was an active part in that. As a music publisher, he was engaged with the Beatles. He didn't just sit back and take the money. And uh, I think he, did, he was in a, a key part of their early breakthrough in Britain. And uh, he was keen to break them internationally. He was trying to get them broken in America in 63. His efforts didn't come to anything, but that wasn't his fault. He was trying. He really was. Along with Brian, uh, he was a key part of the push for the Beatles. And none of that ever gets said. So um, Dick James's debit column gets looked at more than his credit column. And I intend to be looking at both. Oh, I just saw that film Rocket Man the other day. Yeah. And... Um, the portrayal of Dick James is ridiculous, yeah. absolutely ridiculous. First of all, he was never a, a foul mouth swearing man. He was not, he didn't swear at all. Um, secondly, he did not treat Elton in that way. Um, he was a great supporter of Elton. And though ultimately Elton sued him in the mid eighties and lost, um, he was a, a fundamental part of Elton's breakthrough. And he believed in Elton at a time when nobody else did. And Anne stuck with him and gave him studio time and published his songs and tried to get them recorded by musicians. Mm -hmm. And he was Elton John's record label for the mm -hmm. first five years after he started recording in 68. Mm -hmm. um, so it was out, was it five years? Maybe even been longer. It was absolutely outrageous that he was portrayed by that way. And I have no idea, other than as a device in the storytelling, why they portrayed him in that way. Mm -hmm. But I was really outraged on Dick's family's behalf yeah. that he was portrayed that way. I mean, I'm a 40-year fan of the Ruttles, but the one indefensible part of the Ruttles is the way they portray Brian and the Epstein family. Cheap shots. Mm -hmm. and, the, and what Rocket Man does is play a cheap shot at Dick James, mm -hmm. and I wish they had. What are your thoughts on electronic sound and the claims that George released recordings of Bernie Krauss without his approval and credit? Krauss's written account seems plausible to me and fits with what I'm sadly beginning to believe was George's rather unpleasant character, brackets written and authorised by G. Myers. Right. Well, I've, I, I've read Bernie Krause's book, and I also, the friend of mine uh, in America has interviewed Bernie Krause, who, and Bernie gave him chapter and verse on tape about what had happened. Mm. And I, yeah, it seems completely plausible and believable that basically George did kind of crib Bernie Krause's recordings and put them out as his own. I'm not saying it's all Bernie's work. Mm. Um, there is actually, isn't it, is it the American pressing or the British where you can actually see that Bernie Krause's name has been painted over in the artwork oh. on the cover? I think <laughs> I'm right, I'm pretty sure I'm right in saying that there is, you can see where Bernie Krause's name was and it's been painted over, which is a strange thing to have done anyway. Um, so yeah, I, I do believe Bernie's case in that one. And I wouldn't say that it marks George out as a bad guy, uh, because we know so many instances of George being a great guy. But it does show us that there was more than one side to George's character. But it was a strange thing for George to have done, 
to basically abuse somebody else's copyright at a time when, as an artist himself, he would have been aware that you don't do that kind of thing. Indeed. Our third question from Gavin. What was the relationship between George Martin and Norman Smith like? I've read that it was strained. And Jeff Emmerich suggests George took more credit than he should have. <laughs> um, <laughs> I did interview Norman a few times and, and he wasn't mad on George Martin. As I say in Tune In, I mean, there's no question that George Martin was the right guy for the Beatles. There's also no question that he was a gentleman in many ways and that he was a decent, civil, polite man who went out of his way to be kind to people. I received personal kindnesses from George on a number of occasions and they were genuine and everybody knows George Martin was a gent. But as we just said about George Harrison, there can be more to a person than the one than what you see. Mm -hmm. And um, Norman Smith had cause for grievance against George Martin. I'm not exactly sure what it was, but there was some bitterness there. Um, there is often bitterness when someone becomes highly successful mm. and the person or, or the people who have been in the room with them end up not making that money or having that fame or whatever it might be. Uh, the fame suited George well. He wore it well. Um, and he gave the impression of just being this very decent cove. And for the most part, he really was. But it would be unfair to, or it would be incorrect, I think, to think that was all there was to George Martin's character. Mm. In volume one of Tune In, uh, I show how he sidelined Sue Coleman and Kim Bennett and Ardmore and Beechwood and basically peddled a different story to write them out of his, their role in things. And, you know, this happens yeah. in life, this happens. And with regard to, um, there was a guy called Ron Richards, who for several years was George Martin's assistant at Parlophone, and then they formed Air as equal partners. Uh, and um, Ron had quite a few anti-George Martin tales that seemed genuine to me. Uh, and I knew Ron's wife, and she wouldn't hear George's name mentioned. She was okay. so angry about things. Right, okay. So th the way we see George Martin was not false, but what would be false is to think that was all there was. In the um, Arena documentary, his son Giles, to Giles' great credit, brings up with his father on camera the fact that George had a great rivalry and enmity with Norrie Paramore, and that, that it never went away. Um, and indeed, in Tune In, when I write about how Norrie Paramore was lampooned viciously on That Was The Week That Was, the first satire TV show, the first edition of the first satire TV show, had an attack on Norrie Paramore, the EMI mm. record producer, that was fed to David Frost by George Martin. So there was more to George Martin than met the eye, but what you saw was true, but there was just more to him, as there is with many of us. Paul wrote some very moving words in tribute to Jeff Emmerich, which clearly showed their relationship was closer than just artist slash engineer. What are your thoughts on why this was? Probably again, I'd give your opinion. Yes. Well, I did see Paul and Jeff together on quite a few occasions. Paul really liked Jeff Emery, as an engineer, I mean. Uh, and um, so he had him, he knew him from, well, early days on Beatles. When did Jeff work first with it? Was it She Loves You session? It was tape op. I think it might have been. He was tape op on some 63 sessions. Yeah. Uh, but you know, Paul wouldn't have paid much attention to him then, but from 66, certainly with the engineering on Revolver and then Pepper, mm. Magical Mystery Tour, bits of, White Album, bits of, Abbey Road, he worked at Apple. Um, but then post Beatles, Paul continued to use Jeff, so obviously he rated him. And Paul did once mention to me that he really liked Jeff's training, his thoroughness, his understanding of sound. I think, I've never been a music creator, but when you are creating music, if the person working the board knows what you are looking for and gives you what you want and you don't have to keep explaining it to someone, you're going to value that person. Yeah. And that seemed to be the relationship that they had. And um, the last time I really spent any length of time with Jeff was during the anthology, which is now 20 years ago, mm. more, 25 years ago. Um, and he was there at Paul's insistence. Not at George Harrison's insistence, because George didn't like Jeff Emery. And as I mentioned in another podcast recently, um, the reason why Jeff Emery is so anti-George Harrison in his memoir is because George started it. 
he was getting his own back for George being really mean to him. And George did begin that. It didn't come from Jeff. OK, it was tit for tat, so, you know, no one wins, really. Um, but nonetheless, that was why there was such a lot of anti-George stuff in that book. I don't think it would have been there had George not been horrible to him first. Um, but Paul always liked Jeff and used him, well, until relatively recently, mm. I think. Um, and, and obviously, therefore, would have had a lot of time in his company and you know, probably been around his house a lot. I mean, Paul at Jeff, at Paul's house, I mean, and so on. So I expect that uh, that's, they had something deeper than just engineer yeah. artist relationship I think you hit the nail on the head if he, if he understood what Paul wanted then yeah. he was going to be on side yes yes that makes yeah. a lot of sense greatly frustrating uh, if you're an artist and you're continually having to explain to someone what it is you want they yeah. think they know best Jeff would have known what Paul wanted and, it, and would have given him what he wanted yeah. And, and, and Paul's albums by engineered by Jeff were always well-engineered albums, so he was right to be using him. Yeah. Uh, and also, Paul, like all artists, can be really difficult in the studio. Um, and no doubt Jeff saw a lot of um, shout-ups uh, and, and, and stayed and could get beyond it, so, which will be another reason for keeping him on. Mark, I just want to thank you for spending the time again. I want to wish you continued success. You've had a great year. You've had a, a big year. You've got a lot of work to do. We all know that and appreciate that. And what you've done so far has been absolutely amazing. So wish you well with that. Yes. So Merry Christmas to you and a prosperous 2020 from all Thank of you. us. Thank, Thank you. you Let it be Beatles. Thank you, Let It Be Beatles. Thank you, the people of Australia and anyone else who's listening to this. And uh, Gary Crimble, 